I did become a naturalist at an early age. I think it was the day that I was uh, strong enough that I could actually pick up a field guide and flip it open and start trying to connect what I was seeing outside with what was in that field guide. I got hooked immediately. And eventually that turned into a love of birds and that was really just set off by being amazed at how many species of birds I could see in my own backyard. Uh, that diversity hooked me quickly and then I've started traveling more and the diversity of birds is pretty incredible. The diversity of biology, of course, is amazing, but I'm slightly biased. Um, so this will be a slightly biased talk, uh, talking about how amazing birds are. There are about 10,000 species recognized, so I'll kind of give you the answer now, but the voyage this evening is going to be, how did we get to the point where we can say that there are 10,000 species of birds in the world? And I'd like to start us off by going birding. We could take a walk outside and wander maybe up the hill towards Shaker Lakes and take a look and see what birds are around. One of the species we might get lucky and encounter is this one. Now I know you're not all birders, but I'm sure you can all recognize that this is an owl of some sort. You recognize the facial discs, you might recognize that kind of round head, kind of the expression that they have. But this is one of the owls. And with that field guide that I picked up when I was a kid, I could look it up and find out, oh, this is a barred owl. I could even get really picky and say, what's the scientific name of this bird? And find that that is Strix varia. And we'll encounter a little bit more about Strix varia soon. So it's easy enough now to go outside, find a bird, flip through a guide, match what you're seeing, and say, this is the species I'm seeing. Then you can travel to somewhere like Maine and go birding, and you see the bird that looks just about like this. You say, huh, that looks familiar. I wonder if it's the same thing. Look through your field guide. Yep, that's Strix varia, the barred owl, yet again. Then you take another trip and go to Arizona, and you see another similar looking owl. And you look in your field guide, and Strix varia does not occur there. Strix occidentalis, the spotted owl, is there. Two very closely related species. Somewhere along the line, a taxonomist did work and decided that those are two different species. And I want to cover the, joy, the voyage that gets us to that point. So my talk tonight is going to be in three sections. First off, well, we're in a natural history museum, so we'll talk about the role of natural history museums in documenting diversity. Then we'll step into how many bird species there are and how we get that number. And then I'd like to conclude talking about why this matters in the first place. Why do we care how many species there are, where they occur, and what their scientific names are? So, when you walked in the front door of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, you walked in on our third floor. If we drop down <clears throat> to the second floor, we're in the bird hall. Half of our second floor is open to the general public. But the other half of our second floor and all of the first floor is closed to the general public because that's where our research collections live. So what we'll do is take a sort of voyage behind the scenes, beyond where we see things like these wonderful taxidermy mounts. This bird hall shows the diversity of Ohio's birds with wonderful taxidermy. Taxidermy is all about art. This is about portraying the birds to make them look as close to lifelike as possible. When we step behind the scenes, instead we find row after row of white cases. And if we open the right one, we'll find that we have an entire case full of barred owl specimens. This is a set of several dozen barred owls. This is part of 30,000 bird specimens that are behind the scenes in the collections here. Let's grab the closest uh, uh, barred owl and take a look at what's on the specimen. So we have these study skins and the true value in them lies with these tags that have been attached to them. So again, we're separating ourselves from the art of taxidermy and getting into the science of the collections. Let's read what's on the tag. This bird was Cleveland Museum of Natural History, bird number 25,180. There's Strix varia. Collected in Gates Mills in Cuyahoga County, November 23rd, 1925. So specimen has been in our collections for, you know, 90 some or 90 or so years at this point. It's a female, and it was collected by uh, Samuel Princess Baldwin. Baldwin was one of the early trustees of the Natural History Museum back in the 1920s. He also founded what was called the Baldwin Bird Research Laboratory in Gates Mills. 
and some of the earliest ornithology work done in Ohio was carried out by Baldwin. So he's a very important figure, and as far as I know, all of his specimens are within our collections. Let's flip over that tag and see what else we can learn. He wrote that the bird was 21 inches in length, and that was all that was recorded. I would love to give you another lecture sometime on what we can do with specimen data. Tonight we're focusing on taxonomy, but you can do so much more with what's on these uh, labels. And I'll return to the nature of labels. But again, let's focus on the fact that on the front of this label, it said Strix varia. Why use that Latinized two-word name? Well, that's thanks to work done by Linnaeus. Linnaeus published uh, a series of books in his lifetime called the Systema Naturae, or the System of Nature. And Linnaeus established two really important things for taxonomy. One of those is this sort of hierarchical ordering of how things are related to each other. You had to memorize this in a class somewhere. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And there's actually a lot more categories than that that have been added since. But he established the first three kingdoms, which are plant, animal, or mineral. Um, and uh, things have been revised quite a bit since then, as you might imagine. But he came up with this hierarchical approach but the other thing he did was come up with what's the two-word scientific name for species, the binomial nomenclature, the two names. Before Linnaeus, if you were describing a species that you had discovered, you would publish it in a journal or other sort of publication, and you would write a description of your new species completely in Latin. So the species description would be this long paragraph so we have a communication problem, all right? First, you've got to be pretty fluent in Latin to understand what's going on. And if you have a specimen in your hand and you want to figure out what species it is, you now need to assemble all of these published paragraphs that describe the birds of the world and compare yours to all of those. In the 1700s, the internet connections were really poor. So it was very hard to get access to all of this information. So communication really slowed things down. And it was just a pretty clunky system. So to streamline things, you take the genus name. In the case of the barred owl, that would be Strix. And then you designate which species it is within that genus, Strix varia. So you have the specific epithet, varia. You put them together, Strix varia is a scientific name. Our scientific name is, of course, Homo sapiens. Genus Homo, specific epithet, sapiens. All right, so this is just a much simpler system. This was established in uh, 1735 with his first volume, but then he revised it through his life, uh, Linnaeus did, and by 1758 he had published the tenth version of this series, and that is where we consider that our modern taxonomy truly began. That first volume included all of the birds that were known to Linnaeus at the time, all 564 species of birds. But what Linnaeus accomplished was really important, and we pay homage to him here at the Natural History Museum. As you walked up uh, to the museum, you passed a statue of Linnaeus, and he's out there peering upon our work every day. The work he did was codified into what's now known as the ICZN, the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. I never can remember all these words, so that's why it's here on the slide. Uh, but this was established starting in the late 1800s. Their first real publication appeared in 1905. And they said, we've got to make, we need to get the theories of Linnaeus into a common practice. There's a lot to the code, and I'm only going to give you two of the high points. One is they, they said, yep, we're going with Linnaeus's principle of binomial nomenclature. Strix varia is the way we're going to approach this. They also established the principle of priority. In the 1700s, folks like Audubon and other early naturalists were wandering around the world describing new species. They would find what was unknown to them and put it in their books, which came out perhaps years later. At the same time, other naturalists were wandering the, the wilderness and finding that same new species. It was unknown to them, so they would describe it in their book that came out a few years later. 
And so for something like a white-throated sparrow, you might have several different publications all trying to describe the white-throated sparrow. So which one do you go with? The first one, whoever published first. So that's where this race for priority began. The methodology is that you must designate a type specimen. I'm describing a new species. I'm going to look at a lot of museum specimens, but I'm going to say this one museum specimen and give the museum name and what its number is, is the type. This is the basis for the description of this new species. The importance here is that now science can uh, deal with repeatability. If I think you made a taxonomic error, I can go look at your type and see if you did a measurement wrong or if your uh, locality information is odd or something is off. This also made it important to have a permanent specimen record that could be accessed years and years later. I showed you a barred owl that was from the 1920s, and honestly, if I had one from the 1920s and from the early 2000s side by side, you probably couldn't tell which one was older. They hold up very well, and natural history museums often have three and 400 year old specimens in their collections. So if taxonomy is gonna be stable, we need a nice permanent specimen collection. Specimen collections go beyond the round skins that I showed you earlier. Uh, this can involve things like nests and eggs. Uh, some new species were described from their skeletons rather than the actual plumage. Sometimes bumps on bones are really important, and all of our folks that work in paleobiology that deal with fossils know that that's certainly the case. And nowadays, the labels that go on our specimens are really data rich. So let's take a look at this one. This bird is Cleveland Museum of Natural History 71991. It's Poeseal atricapolis. That tells us this is the humble black-capped chickadee. This one came from Monroe County, Michigan. We have the latitude and longitude on here. We have the date that it was found. And this was what was aged as an AHY male after hatch year. So this bird was found in 2011. We know that it hatched at least the year before. Let's flip over the tag. Remember length, 21 inches on that barred owl? We go a little more uh, in depth nowadays. We've got the weight. This bird was actually um, a bird that had been banded. A bander puts a small aluminum uh, label on the bird and lets it go. This one, when he caught it later, had died in the net. We actually measured the, um, the length and width of the left and right testis on males. Uh, it's the only way we can monitor breeding readiness in these birds. Their reproductive organs change throughout the uh, uh, course of the year. We have the wing cord and wing span, so just sort of the overall size of the bird. How fat it was, what was in its stomach, how much ossification was in the skull. Remember the fontanelle that kids get? They have a soft spot. On birds, their whole head starts as cartilage, and it takes a while to turn to bone, and we can age our birds based on that. And we know this bird was banded as a young bird the year before. So we got a lot of great information on this bird. And beyond that, we save a spread wing. We freeze the tissue from it, and that goes into uh, ultra-cold freezers or in liquid nitrogen for uh, future DNA work. And increasingly, people are tying their specimens to uh, information about song and even video of the specimens. There was a bird in South America that people said, that looks similar to a flycatcher that we know, but it's a little bit different. When it lands, it flips its wings up. And they obtained the song of the bird, they obtained video of the bird, they obtained some DNA sequences and said, you know what, we've discovered a new species of flycatcher. So now the voucher, the type specimen, includes all of this information. That's not to say that old specimens don't have value. The ivory-billed woodpecker is uh, one of our lost species. Uh, we do monitor things that have gone extinct, and that's one of the sadder but more, uh, but equally important roles of natural history museum collections. So is, is there a gigantic uh, computer database with all of this information that you can browse and scan and retrieve information from? Yeah, so are we databasing everything is the question, and absolutely. We're, um, when I started here, if I wanted to know what birds we have from, say, Hocking County, Ohio, I would have to go specimen by specimen through 30,000 birds. Uh, so one of the first things I did was bring in a number of volunteers, and they went through all 30,000 specimens and have digitized that information. 
Uh, we're in the final proofreading stage to make sure there's no typos. I've seen a couple of misspelled genus names, and Strix has been misspelled a couple of times. Um, and so we're updating that, and that will join an international database. So if you want to understand the birds of Hawking County, Ohio, you can actually search 40 different natural history museums all at once. At what point did tissue samples start getting collected? Uh, tissue samples uh, began in the 80s. The DNA revolution really started you know, uh, being recognized as having utility with museum specimens in the 80s, but that was limited then. I would consider any specimen prepared after the mid-90s or so, I would expect to have a tissue sample with it. Uh, some of the smaller, more regional collections don't have tissue collections at this point. And I feel like that's one of the roles as, at a larger museum like this is to work with some of our neighbors to try and encourage them to uh, keep these collections too. Why do you still handwrite the labels? Oh, yeah, handwriting labels is, is important. Yeah, we, I've been on, a, on expeditions where we might have hundreds of specimens to deal with and your hand cramps when you're working through these. But a typo is impossible to recover. Handwriting, if there is a seven or a Z in your handwriting is hard to tease apart, well then we can actually have a debate about it. But if you type in a Z or a seven and you typed in the wrong one, we'll never know. So I feel like handwritten labels are more accurate because of the nature of mistakes that get made. There have been cases where um, location information has been doubted on a specimen. People thought, oh, they actually wrote down the wrong location and they're able to see things like well, this was collected by a certain well-known collector, but it's not his handwriting. And so falsified documents have been discovered because handwritings didn't match up before. The distinguishment of whether it's a new species or not seems to rely upon those things that are uh, very minor in scope rather than relying upon uh, fertility between sexes, for example. So yeah, so is, one of the criteria for whether things are a different species or not is whether they can interbreed. Our first pass, we often don't have that information yet. We have a newly discovered thing that looks a little different from another thing. Maybe they occur across different mountain ranges or something. And so our initial scope take is these might be new species. Often we follow that up with field experiments where you do playback or you do other things to see if there can be reproduction. This then, uh brings up the owl in the Northeast versus the one in Arizona. Uh, and I somehow suspect that they could breed together. And the distinguishment as a separate species, at least from what you said, seems extremely minor compared to those species that have great differences that we don't distinguish as being separate species within the uh, uh, the, spe the species within the, the kingdom. The case of that, these two owls, the spotted and the barred owl, is really interesting because the spotted is exclusively west coast, the barred owl is in the forests of the east and into northern Canada. But historically there was no overlap between them. But we have changed the scope of forest across the northern Great Plains. Barred owls have moved west, they've encountered uh, uh, spotted owls, and you and I could listen to them singing and immediately know which one is which. They apparently do too, but they don't care, and now they're hybridizing. And so we're getting hybridizing throughout the state of Washington and, uh, and southern uh, Canada, and this has become an issue because the spotted owl is endangered. The barred owl is an abundant, widespread bird, so how do we deal with this? It's really a complicated scenario now. You've also created a third species of that owl. <laughs> you have a hybrid group, and they seem to be, we seem to see the barred owls swamping out the spotted so far. And then we're going to take drastic action to preserve the species? It's been proposed. Well, why? It's been proposed. You know, it's, it, that's a much more complicated question that I, I wouldn't be able to get into now. All right, so the, the second portion of the talk, I'd like to focus in on this 10,000 number and really, especially, how do we know that that is the right number or a close number or something that uh, matches reality. So let's talk about the old days. So remember, uh, Linnaeus established that there were 564 species of birds around the world, and we've got a long way to go to get to the number that we're at today, as recognized by taxonomy. So the old days, 
was you would send ornithologists into various areas around the world. They would collect specimens, they would study the birds there. This was often at great personal peril because they were exposed to disease and all sorts of problems. Transportation was very complicated and so forth. And along these initial explorations, you had folks, there were only a handful of really active ornithology professionals in the world. This was not like today where there are lots of us that attend our annual meetings. And so you had a handful of specialists and sometimes you would travel somewhere and find what is clearly a new species. The first person, uh, for the first taxonomist to encounter this bird certainly knew what a toucan looked like, but there was no known toucan with this ridiculous solid orange beak. That's an easy discovery. But you also have things like this. These are some of the sap suckers of North America. Sap suckers are a type of woodpecker. They're named sap sucker because they drill really shallow holes in the trees in your backyard. The sap flows out of it and they drink the sap and they also eat whatever bugs get caught up in there. All right, my taxonomist friends, how many species am I showing on this slide? So on the right side, we have two different species. The one on the top is called the red-naped sap sucker. The one on the bottom right is the yellow-bellied sapsucker, which is the one that may be in your yard today. Those differ by maybe 30 red feathers on the nape of the neck and by some of the details of the back feathers. They're pretty difficult to tell apart, and again, there's a little bit of hybridizing that happens. The two birds on the left were initially described as two different sapsucker species. They look really different from each other. But then somebody collected a larger series of them and noticed the ones in the top left are always male and the ones in the bottom left are always female. These are Williamson sapsuckers, male and female. So which one gets the correct name for Williamson sapsucker? Whoever described that species first, whether it was the male or female. And I think in this case it was the female that came first. But that's complicated. That is not a simple, oh, look at that thing, it's clearly different. This takes a lot of revision and revision to get to a better understanding. This takes careful museum work as well as field observation. So let's leave those old days behind and move into the modern era, which you'll recognize as being very, very different. Uh, the photo I showed you early is actually from 2002. And this was an expedition to northwestern Russia that I participated in when I was a graduate student. That's me second from the right. This was a group of folks, two of us were from Minnesota. One guy was from Moldova, the rest were from the Darwin Museum in Moscow. And we were part of a series of expeditions throughout uh, Eurasia to do further revisions on the diversity of birds across Europe and Asia. Our techniques were similar to what was going on in the late 1700s and early 1800s. We didn't discover any, let me back up, we didn't discover any new species along the way. We didn't expect to. The birds of Europe and Asia are awfully well known. But what did happen is that some of the specimens we collected represented areas that had never been sampled for even common birds like the great tit, which is the comparable black-capped chickadee of the old world. And as a result of our specimens and other collections, the taxonomy of dozens of birds has been rewritten because we needed hundreds of samples that range, some of these birds range from Great Britain to Japan and they had just not been well studied. So lots of taxonomic updates came as a result, but that required dozens and dozens of ornithologists over several decades. So the early phase of discovery and revision basically relied on us looking at specimens and occasionally listening and observing behaviors of the birds in the wild. Then as the 1900s came along and statistics became established and well represented, measurements became more important, we did true statistical tests and we could see, oh, this population is a different size than that one, perhaps they are different species and that sped up the process of revisions, but now we're under a very different era. The DNA era has really sped things up yet again. I did alizyme work as an undergraduate, 
the lab I was in was just starting to do some of the DNA sequencing work, and at that point it was complicated and expensive. Today, if you can follow a recipe to make dinner, you can sequence DNA. Uh, the lab techniques are really quite straightforward, and it's possible to generate large amounts of sequence data pretty quickly and for not a ton of money. And that's really changed the way things are being done nowadays. So let me walk you through an example of that. This is a bird that, if you're a birder, you know this one from Northeast Ohio. This is the Eastern Meadowlark. The Eastern Meadowlark covers a lot of Eastern North America. And as you go west, you actually start noticing some of the Meadowlarks look and sound a little different. As you can tell, that's a very different bird, right? Now the, the back color is slightly different. The amount of yellow on the throat is slightly different. The amount of white in the tail differs in a real subtle way, and the song is different. But that's Eastern versus Western Meadowlark, two well-established species. The Western was described in the late 1800s, and the ornithologist that described it was pretty surprised it took that long for it to be recognized as a different species. So when he came to giving it a Latin name, he called it Sternella neglecta. They had neglected to recognize that bird for a surprising amount of time. So the western meadowlark is the Great Plains and further west. This is the range of the eastern meadowlark. The eastern meadowlark, uh, you can ignore the two different color tones here. They basically nest across southern Canada throughout eastern North America, and they continue into Central America and even uh, northern Venezuela. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that there is a separate population that's not connected that's in the desert southwest. Arizona, New Mexico, Sonora, there is another population of eastern meadowlark that's way west. That population is known as the Lillian's eastern meadowlark. That population was not studied until the 1930s. The first person to collect any samples of these was working in association with the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and sent the specimens to the ornithologist here and said, here's some eastern meadowlarks. He spent time comparing these to the eastern and western and said, it's a type of eastern meadowlark, but it's a subspecies of eastern meadowlark. So he named it Sternella magna liliani. This is named after Lillian Hannah Baldwin, the wife of Samuel Prentice Baldwin. Before she married Samuel Baldwin, she was a Hannah. Uh, that family is well known, of course, in the Cleveland area. And there's even a um, endowed chair of obstetrics at University of Hospital that uh, her family, uh, or I'm sorry, that is named after Lillian um, Hannah Baldwin. So there's an interesting Cleveland connection, even though this bird would never, ever occur in Cleveland. And so when he described that subspecies, he designated a type specimen, and that is one floor below us here. And so this is the sample that he used. He's had a series of other ones available, but this is the type. When I was at Minnesota as a graduate student, some of the folks in the lab that I was working in were doing other work on the genetics of meadowlarks. And they published a paper a few years ago, the assessment of species limits among meadowlarks using DNA. Their results are presented as a phylogeny. I don't want to spend a lot of time getting into the details, but basically they clustered really similar genotypes to each other on this tree. And what they found is that they recover three different groups, the eastern, the lilians, and the western. Another way to say that is that those three groups are equally different from each other genetically. And so their recommendation, and one that I concur with, is that we should elevate Lillian's meadowlark based on DNA, plumage, and song to a full species. And again, the type specimen is here in our collections. All right, so this is the initial subspecies was described. That's like a hypoth hypothesis. Now we've tested it with uh, DNA evidence, and we reject the hypothesis of, of subspecies and say this has actually got better support as a species. So that's some revisions, but there have been lots of discoveries that have continued throughout the years. Um, Ernst Marr, who I'm sure you all uh, know that name very well, uh, he is an ornithologist, or was an ornithologist, as well as being a major player within um, evolution. 
1946, he suggested there were perhaps 100 species of birds left to discover. What do you think? Was he correct? No. Since 1946, more than 350 new species have been described. Again, this does not include revisions like the meadowlarks. This is going out and finding a new species that nobody knew about yet. Birds are our best known biological group, period. So it's pretty amazing that we're still discovering birds at this rate. And it has increased in the last 20 years. In the last two decades, 128 species were discovered. There's a great book series called The Handbook of Birds of the World. It's 17 volumes. Uh, it weighs a lot more than I do. It's a massive treatment of every species of bird. It took them 20 years to publish it, and when they were done, they said, we gotta put out one more volume to catch up on the 128 that came out while we were publishing these volumes. Um, so it's, it's pretty remarkable how fast things are being discovered, and it's because we're exploring very remote areas. One of the most important technologies out there now for finding new species of birds is Google Earth. A lot of people are looking at maps of where their specimens come from, which areas of the world have been well explored, and where there might be odd topography that might have little isolated samples. One of the guys I've, I've worked with here in Cleveland found such an area in Peru. They traveled to Peru and they found a new species of bird as a result of that. So how fast are we finding these species? Well, one of the ways to look at this is to use a curve that we borrow from ecology called a species accumulation curve. So on the x-axis, we have the years. Starts with Linnaeus on the left and goes up to 2008, so almost to today. And on the y-axis, we just have a percentage of all of the bird species that we know today that were described at that point. So we're gonna start with a very low number because 526 is at the number, 564 is a very small percentage of the 10,000. But what does the shape of this curve look like? I'm actually gonna plot several different things. Uh, in addition to the total number of birds that have been described, I've also pulled out a number of other groups within the birds, and I'm sorry for the labels here. One is the passerines, that's the songbirds, chickadees, warblers, nuthatches, all the small charismatic birds. The other group is the non-passerines, everything else. That's, um, we can also break up the passerines into two groups, ossines and sub -ossines, and that just has to do with their song learning abilities. We put them all together, we get essentially the same curve for all of these. So interestingly, the rate of discovery really accelerated once we hit the early 1800s. Travel was becoming easier, communication was improving, lots of parts of the world that we can uh, get access to, museums start talking to each other a lot more, sending specimens on loan back and forth, and so forth. But this accumulation curve has not flattened off. You can see that there's still a little bit of an uptick going on here. And if we added the last few years, you would still see that uptick. What this tells us is that there are not 15,000 species of birds in the world. It tells us that we're not quite done because this curve has not flattened off, but we're not too far off. So probably 10,500 or 11,000 is probably in the ballpark. What is the effect of uh, destruction of the jungles and the rainforest, that type of thing, on uh, discovery of uh, bird species? Deforestation plays a major role in what's happening here. Um, one of the issues is we're afraid that we're losing species that we've not yet discovered. So the rate of discovery can be slowed down because some of these things are disappearing. There are certain areas I could point to on a map. One would be the Atlantic coastal forest of Brazil, and the other would be uh, all of the island archipelagos around Indonesia, the Philippines, and so forth. Really huge amounts of deforestation and a lot of those areas have very narrowly, district, uh, uh, narrowly distributed species. And those were often, we, we think we are losing some of these species before they're discovered. Um, so we're not losing thousands, we're losing dozens for sure. Who decides whether you have a new species? How is that process done? Who decides if it's a new species? So when we, when we publish a paper saying this is a new species, that's, opinion based on science. 
And so we can have lots of people claiming to have lots of new species. So one of the first passes is, can you get your paper published in the first place? Is the science good enough? And so you go through that peer review process, but there still can be complications. And so we now have uh, taxonomy by committee. There are groups like the American Ornithologist Union Checklist Committee. They are the authority for North and Central America and the Caribbean. And so when these papers come out, they get together and they evaluate, was this good science? Did they sample correctly? Have they understood their own data? And then they vote on whether to approve or not approve. And that seems like a pretty good system, but there have been cases where their votes pass by only one vote or fail by only one. That's pretty tough. That's feeling separate from a, a basic science. It's a lot more complicated and it can be political in some of those cases too. The, the committees work autonomously, so there are various committees for different European countries. There's now one that covers all of South America, which has one-third of all of our bird species. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, the remainder of the world does not have many of their own autonomous groups. So another group established the World Checklist Committee, and they disagree with what some of the regional ones have said too. So it can be extremely complicated and contentious. When you're collecting them, yeah. are they already dead or do you have to make them dead? So where do our specimens come from? Nowadays, the vast majority that we get come from places like rehabilitation centers. Uh, they get a lot of birds turned into them and they have roughly a 50% success rate. If a bird has been bitten by a cat, it's guaranteed to die because they're gonna get an infection. If they have a broken wing in the middle of the wing, that can be healed, but if it's at near one of the uh, the joints, they're not going to be able to fly again. And so we get a lot of our specimens that way, but there are certain species and there are certain behaviors like being a treetop bird, those birds don't end up in rehab centers. And so there are cases where I go out and I collect, and to collect a specimen means I need federal, state, and local permits. Those permits have to justify how many individuals of each species why I need them, what I'm gonna do with them, guarantee that they're gonna be in a museum collection that's accessible to other research um, folks out there. So there is collecting that still goes on, but what's the impact that has on wild bird populations? That's the question we need to ask. It feels kind of weird to be out there collecting. Historically, anyone could do it, but in 1918, Migratory Bird Treaty Act said only people with permits can do it. If we look at what all of the natural history museums in North America collect in a single year, it's the equivalent of what 15 Cooper's hawks eat in a year. There are 15 Cooper's hawks nesting just within the greater Cleveland region for sure. In fact, there's probably 100 or more. So the impact from those birds is greater than all of the natural history museums combined. My third section is why all of this matters in the first place. And I want to begin with something that was pretty shocking. In 2000, a paper was published saying that we have discovered a new species of sage grouse from southwestern Colorado. This was not a taxonomic revision like the Meadowlark case. This was people working in the field in southwestern Colorado that were familiar with what was considered that really widespread sage grouse of the western US, but they noticed that they're a little bit different looking and they sound a little bit different. And they said, we've been overlooking this thing for over a century. They already existed in museum collections, but people hadn't noticed how different they were. And so they said, we've been overlooking this thing. It is a new species under our noses in North America. And that's pretty remarkable. This was published as the last new species to be discovered in North America in the bird world. That may be the case. There may be a couple of things that could still linger, but those are probably gonna be revisions at this point. So this is a pretty remarkable example. So they renamed the widespread one. It went from being the sage grouse to being the greater sage grouse because it is larger. And this new one comes from the Gunnison area in Colorado, so it's called the Gunnison sage grouse. They identified this by the fact that the Gunnison sage grouse is smaller and some of the overall shape differs from other sage grouse. They did sequence DNA and found there are some unique differences from Gunnison versus the greater sage grouse. They also looked at some of the feather details. And here's some of those examples. Uh, 
the top is the uh, greater sage grouse, the bottom is the gunnison sage grouse, um, and then these are two different tail feathers. But they also looked at male displays. These guys are crazy looking in display. I mean, you saw in the last image, um, that's a really strange looking beast. These males display by inflating bright yellow throat sacs. So they're filling these little sacs with air and those puff out, out of the feathers. They stand upright, they flare these weird feathers on the napes of their necks and then they flip out their tail feathers and hold those up too. And their biology during breeding is really cool too. They don't just sit there by themselves in a sage field and do this waiting for a female to come by. The males all congregate on an arena. It's called a lek, L-E-K. But all the males sit together and they've claimed their own little couple of square feet within that arena. They're not quite shoulder to shoulder or wrist to wrist, but they're very sandwiched in together. And they stomp around and they display and the one that's in the very center has worked the hardest to get his position because he's surrounded by hopeful rivals that want to get in there. So this painting shows that there's a couple of females that have approached. They're the ones that don't have the ridiculous uh, headdress and, and throat sacks and so forth. And the females make a selection by watching them display. More than 90% of the time, they choose that one male in the very center of the lek. So it's a crazy sexual selection kind of scenario. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's possible to go see this. There are blinds that have been built near these leks and you have to reserve them weeks and sometimes months in advance because birders love going out and see this. You don't want to disturb the birds so you have to go out before dawn and basically freeze drinking your coffee, staying awake, waiting for dawn to watch this display but you get to see it very close. and. Uh, any of the, the prairie grouse, they all have crazy displays. And if you're ever in the right area, including Illinois, which has greater prairie chickens, it's worth your time to go see this kind of display. But so this is a taxonomic change. A new species has been recognized. That's all well and good. It's unusual because it's a new one found in North America. But it just got much more complicated. In January of this year, the US Fish and Wildlife Service suggested that this should be declared an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act. There are fewer than 5,000 Gunnison sage grouse in the world. They're restricted to about eight counties in southwestern Colorado. They used to be in parts of New Mexico and Utah. Those are mostly gone. And so they say, this is a species that's in trouble. We need to do something to help it out. We need to recognize it as an endangered species. When you just declare that something is an endangered species, one of the things that comes along with it is you declare critical habitat. What habitat do we need to own and manage for this species in order to help their numbers recover? They designated 1.7 million acres of critical habitat. Some of this is private, some of this is federally protected, but if you're familiar with land issues in the West, you know that there's a ton of land owned by things like the Bureau of Land Management federal and state owned properties, but these are leased out for mineral and cattle and other leases. So there are lots of local folks that de their livelihood depends on access to these properties. And now this newly described species has said, we gotta change the land use patterns in these eight counties. So up until last year, if you did a Google search on Gunnison sage grouse, you found a lot of cool articles about how neat this bird is and how cool it is that we found this new species. If you do a Google search now, you'll find lots of angry letters to the editor about this stinking bird and what it's doing to uh, my uh, land access. So clearly we have taxonomy causing a conservation issue that's now becoming a public policy problem. Taxonomy matters. Another case uh, that's sort of a, a different outcome is a bird called the Viri. And this is some of the work that I've been uh, carrying out for the last five years. The Viri is a species of thrush. This is related to the American robin that's in your backyard. If you know the wood thrush that sings in uh, Ohio in the summer, this is also closely related. Their song's nicer than a wood thrush. It's a pretty amazing song. Um, it, it's a handsome little bird. And here is their distribution. The areas shown in pink 
are the places where it nests. So it's found in the high elevations of the Appalachian Mountains. I knew this bird as a kid as a mountaintop bird. We didn't see them in the lowlands in East Tennessee. And then they continue north through the Appalachians across southern Canada, the Great Lakes region, and they extend over into the Rockies. In the Rockies, they are not mountaintop birds. They are lower elevation birds. The areas shown in yellow, which covers most of eastern North America, would be the migratory uh, range of the species. And what is not shown on this map is that their wintering distribution is lowland Brazil. So this is a bird that weighs less than the American robins in your backyard. And every year, they're taking off and flying over the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean and making it to lowland South America. In the spring, they turn around and come north through Central America, across the, from the Yucatan Peninsula to uh, the southern United States, and then spread back out to their uh, nesting grounds. It's a cool bird. And this is what their typical eastern habitat looks like. I can almost hear the mosquitoes buzzing right now. They like really wet woods. And again, that's high elevations in the Appalachian Mountains. By the time you reach somewhere like Ohio, we get them just in Ashtabula County and a couple of other spots in extreme northeast Ohio where we have nice uh, uh, deep swamps. And it's a pretty special place. But then they occur in the west as well. And the birds to the west of the black line that I've drawn on this map were initially described as a different species. And they called the birds of the west the willow thrush. And that's what their habitat looks like. The veeries of the west, the willow thrush, are found where cottonwood trees have a sort of shrubby willow lower layer. And that's where they nest. That means in the west, you're standing really close to a creek, because that does not exist if those trees' uh, roots are not wet. From where I took this photo, if you walked 100 feet to the left or right, you would be in open, dry, chaparral habitat that's totally inhospitable to the species. So this is what we'd call a riparian species. They're just along waterways. They have these long, thin uh, distributions. It's a very different, different habitat. So I wanted to understand something about the genetics of Viri. And so using museum samples, uh, we've done some DNA sequencing. The sequences have come from the areas shown with blue dots. So a lot of the uh, places in the east. Uh, I visited Colorado. And I'm also borrowing specimens from a couple of other states, which I'm waiting uh, for those to come in soon. And the results are presented in a diagram I need to walk you through. That's not intuitive immediately. Uh, what this is is a graphical representation of the genetic diversity that I found. So I'm just showing you my first pass, which is we sequenced 1,000 base pairs out of one gene. And for each individual, it's on this distribution separated by one line if those two individuals differed by a single base pair. And if there's a circle that has a bunch of individuals drawn in it, those, all of those birds were identical. So if we look in the top left, if you see my cursor is up here. There's this group that has three birds from Pennsylvania, two from West Virginia, two from North Carolina, one from Vermont, one from Ohio, one from Michigan. All of those birds were identical when I sequenced them. And then if we go just above that, there's a single line connecting us to a single bird from Ohio. It differed by a single base pair. So this shows our genetic structure. And then we just tell, I'm just telling you where each of those birds came from. What I want to point out is if you pick your favorite state, so here I've highlighted Pennsylvania, you find that there is no concordance between genetic differences and geographic location. Pennsylvania is just randomly shown throughout this network. So there's not much genetic structure in the Viri. And if I highlight my Colorado birds, also no structure. So in this case, I would say willow thrush is not a different species. In fact, I don't think it should even be recognized as a different subspecies. It is just one widespread bird. One of those Colorado birds is identical genetically to eight of the birds from North Carolina. So this is not a conservation priority. I would rather money be spent on Gunnison sage grouse habitat than on willow thrush habitat.
What if we do a much bigger pass? One of the ways we could do this is by taking a museum uh, set of trips for years and looking at all of the birds of Mexico. And so some folks at uh, Kansas and in uh, uh, Mexico have done a lot of this work. They evaluated every single bird in Mexico to see if the taxonomy appears to be correct or if they need to update it. So they looked at some really cool looking birds. Um, and what they found is that it actually shifts our priorities. So what they said is, where in Mexico do we find the greatest diversity of species? Using the old taxonomy and mapping it onto a map that shows where the different habitat types are, here's what we find. The areas in black are of highest conservation value because there's a lot of bird species there. The areas in gray are of intermediate value and the areas in white are of lower conservation value. Now let's update our taxonomy. We've changed the map. Our priorities, if we're trying to save land that has the greatest diversity of bird species on it, we're buying the wrong property if we use the wrong taxonomy. They also made another pass and said, let's focus only on the bird species that have really small distributions, the ones that are in really little areas and the ones that we're very concerned are more likely to go extinct. The map on the left here shows where our priorities would have been using the old taxonomy. So there's an island off the uh, Pacific coast as well as some of the highlands and eastern areas. And with the modern taxonomy, we see a complete shift. The transvolcanic belt now becomes one of the highest important uh, areas as well as a lot of the islands off the coast of Mexico. So how do we pick where we should be spending our money? This is something that uh, Nature Conservancy and many, many other groups ask, and we've got to have the taxonomy right before we start doing this kind of work. So I hope I've convinced you that Taking a lot of time looking at specimens to produce taxonomic names is an important and worthwhile venture. I'd like to summarize with a quote from one of my heroes, Aldo Leopold. The last word in ignorance is the man who says of an animal or plant, what good is it? If the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good whether we understand it or not. If the biota in the course of eons has built something we like but do not understand, then who but a fool would discard seemingly useless parts? To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. The work that taxonomy is doing is establishing what those cogs and wheels are, and then it's up to the next steps to keep our ecosystems functioning. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the folks listed on this slide, including Dan Palou, an undergraduate who did a lot of the genetic work on the Viri that I showed. And I'd like to thank you for your attention.